Thank you. Every generation or so, emerging technologies converge and something revolutionary happens. Such is the case with artificial intelligence, or we know it as AI. It's about to bring upon another industrial revolution. You see, back in the day in first industrial revolution, it was based upon the fact that we had discovered this source of artificial power. Prior to that, in agricultural revolution, everything we did or make was through our muscular power or animal power. The innovation of industrial revolution was based on the fact that we had harnessed steam fuel, fossil power to discover things and make things the way we wanted. Later down the road, we found electricity, and that helped us electrify everything. Now with the advent of computers, internet, and the massive amount of data that we're gathering, uh, we're at the four frontiers of what we call artificial intelligence, yet another source of artificial power to enhance what we do. And it's all around us. You see that in Netflix recommending movies to you. You see that in Amazon recommending products to you. You see that in your Snapchats, creating those funny filters. AI is all around us, yet it's not in places that it needs to be. Uh, we have better ways of choosing products on Amazon than we do in recommending optimal treatment plans for cancer patients. And that is an area that AI will revolutionize. Uh, that's healthcare. This is an image of a chest CT scan. At a Harvard University study, 24 highly trained radiologists were asked to look for signs of lung cancer in a series of images like these. Astonishingly, 20 out of 24 radiologists failed to discover that there is a hairy gorilla embedded in this image. <laughs> and this is not an indictment of radiologists who are otherwise highly trained, they're brilliant and skilled practitioner of their field. However, it is an indication that we have inherent inabilities and limitations that, that do uh, in hinder on what we look at. And that causes misdiagnosis and ultimately incorrect treatment that can be detrimental to patients. So I am a computational cancer scientist. What I do is we develop AI algorithm that can automatically go in and read this medical imaging, particularly in my field, uh, digital pathology or pathology tissue slides, and able to not only provide diagnosis, but skip a step and predict what the outcome of the ca cancer patient will be. And that helps us in figuring out an optimal, a curated, a personalized treatment plan for cancer patients, which is truly lacking at the moment. And we'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more detail about how the treatment plan at the moment is. So let's go through the current clinical workflow of a cancer patient. If a patient is suspected to have a tumor or anomalies, a biopsy is performed. A small tissue sample is taken out for further investigation. We have significant advancements now uh, to digitize that sample. So no longer need to look at a microscope. Uh, you can look at this in a computer. A pathologist then further investigates and looks at these tissue slides to figure out if there's a cancer. If there is, then what is the extent of this cancer? What they look at is the molecular changes that manifest themselves on cells. Uh, the cells change size and shapes and texture and in some cases orientation. And this process is called grading because a pathologist would then assign a grade. Lower the grade, better the prognosis. Higher the grade, the more aggressive the disease is. So for example, on a pro in prostate cancer, uh, there's a rubric that's called a Gleason, Gleason grading scheme. A grade three cancer might look like this, with certain shapes and size of the cells and the glands that are observed by a pathologist. Similarly, a grade four may look like that and grade five, and that's based on a pathologist manually reading these slides and determining the stage. Once the stage is figured out, uh, 
a treatment plan is suggested. Physicians get together and they look at previous clinical trials or outcome from patients who had similar grades. And they look at the average treatment response of those patients and a treatment plan is suggested for that cancer patient. Few problems with this. First of all, we all know that we all are different. The cancer biology is complex. There are thousands of factors that causes cancer and that drive the cancer. Treating to the mean, as they call it in medical terms, is not always an optimal plan or it never, it, it doesn't always work out for the patient. Secondly, the reading of these pathology slides are highly subjective. There are at times where pathologists do not have agreement amongst themselves, particularly on the borderline cases. Uh, the, say, the shape and the sizes of the cells may differ in appearance to one pathologist versus other, depending on the number of years of training they have, uh, the institution they came out of. Thirdly, uh, there are cities in the world where the entire city has only two pathologists. So what we do at Case Western University under Dr. Madhubushi's lab, we keep these goals in mind and come up with an AI that can automatically read the digital imaging here, which is a tissue path pathology, and develop this algorithm that can assess it and not only just assess it and predict at that stage if this patient's gonna become aggressive or not. There are two benefits of that. Firstly, if the patient is predicted to become an aggressive disease, we can treat it accordingly. If the tumor is not gonna become aggressive, then we may just opt for a minimal treatment. For example, in breast cancer, there are, there are reports suggest that almost 50% of women do not need chemotherapy and they can just go, they, they could just survive with hormonal therapy. But we don't have an assay or a predictor that can accurately tell us that. Similarly, in prostate cancer, um, if we can predict if the biochemical recurrence or the cancer is going to come back, or in other words, it's going to be an aggressive disease, then we can treat it accordingly. And, may, and for lower aggressive disease, we do not have to provide chemotherapy or active surveillance, they call it, just watch and wait. So how do we go about training an AI like this well, that, that can read a pathology slide? So I want to give an example from what you guys may be familiar with is the facial recognition. The way facial recognition algorithm works is that it looks for mathematical relationships at the pixel level that define a face. Once it's done that, it constructs a mathematical relationship that is unique to just that face. So for example, uh, Will Ferrell's face generates this unique signature that is only unique to his face, and these are complex mathematical relationships, although they're just numbers. So next time in a series of images or videos, his face comes up, and that's how this is getting tagged or recognized. You see the application of this in Facebook tagging, you see this in Snapchat, and you see this in many other places. In fact, the new iPhone has a similar technology, but it looks at three-dimensional stuff rather than two-dimensional. So taking this further, the first step in having us read these pathology slides is to figure out where the cells are. And that's called an object recognition or image segmentation in AI. So I want to give it a general example of how AI does that or how we built this. There's an image here, and there's a symbol R, which is my alma mater, Rutgers University symbol. And AI s starts with an arbitrary shape. Obviously, it has no idea what it's looking for. but when we infuse information and knowledge and, and mathematical scheme, it's able to go in and starts with this arbitrary shape, but actually conforms to R. And the way it's doing that is using physics, thermodynamics, energy conservation. It, what we do is we take this image and turn it into a field of energies. And so we use the known principles of mathematics and we train our AI to look for these sources of energies in an image. And as we know from physics, there's an equilibrium process, and it reaches an equilibrium when it's found the object it's looking for. And as you saw, that it evolved and stretched into that object. 
Similarly, in pathology, we deal with a lot of elliptical things in nature. However, they are at times either connected, overlapped, or just occluded. To train that, what we did here is we have an ellipse that we can see, but there's a bar that is running through an ellipse, and that confuses a machine that doesn't have uh, a knowledge of how an ellipse looks like. So we came up with an AI that learns the shapes and sizes of ellipse, and it's able to generalize. So if you see here, it's able to evolve and ignores the bar and gives the ellipse back. So now we're ready to let the AI go in and look at the full scale of a digi digital tissue pathology image. And here it is. This is a microarray tissue image of a prostate cancer. The color-coded uh, objects that you see are the cells. It's gone in and accurately identified all the cells, even though they're overlapping, touching, and stuff. So I'm going to zoom in a bit. On the left side, you see that in green outline, AI is able to go in and give us the cells back. And this is a very important step here. Now that we actually know cell, uh, where the cells are and, and what the boundaries are, we're able to go and then do measurements of shape, size, uh, their orientation, their, their texture, just like a pathologist would do. But now we actually have a quantitative way of doing this. So similarly with the face algorithm, now we can generate this unique signature of this tumor that is unique to that patient. Then we run it through something called machine learning algorithm. It learns the signature and creates a model. Once we have this model, now we can feed in thousands of previous cases of, of patients who either survived the cancer, who did not survive the cancer, who, who were a high-risk cancer at the beginning, uh, who were low-risk cancer, and how their follow-up was. We take all of that information, and AI then learns on it because it's able to see this um, cells and be able to quantifiably measure them. We went beyond that. We actually started to look at what happens to a cell structure when, when a cancer attacks the tissue or the molecular level. It actually changed their orientation. And that's something very difficult to see with the human eye. You can see on the right side, the AI has actually created little arrows that indicates at what orientation these cells are. And so that's another feature that is typically very difficult to appreciate with the human eye, but we can do this in a quantifiable manner. This is actually a Facebook graph. And the reason why I brought this up here is that when we are on Facebook, we're one entity. Let's imagine that as a tissue, a world as a tissue image, if you will, a large tissue image, and we're all cells. At times, our connections are close to each other. At times, we are farther from each other. So what Facebook does it is it creates this mathematical graph or a network just like this, and that helps them predict who your next friend should be. And that's how it, it, it's able to tell you, well, you may know this person. That's how Netflix tells you that, well, this is the movie you liked. Well, in the network or graph of things and grand scheme of things, you may like this. So we took a page out of this. And we. so if you go back to the image here, well, these are all cells. With human eye, we cannot tell the relationships here. But can we do something with this algorithm that I just talked about, mathematically create relationships between them? And that's exactly what we did. So this is another tissue image. And there, we created an algorithm, an AI, that actually goes in and looks for these networks of relationships mathematically. So if I'm going to zoom in a little bit here, you can notice here in different colors, there are smaller networks that appear. The interesting about this is that there are these recurring patterns that can predict if this cancer is going to become aggressive or not, if this cancer is going to come back or not. And and we can, we can, the benefit of doing such a thing is that now it gives a wide array of options to physicians to not just rely on that average patient previously, but now we can take in these factors and we have a way of predicting if this patient is going to become aggressive and treat them that way. And if the patient is not going to become aggressive, let's not give them chemotherapy. 
So what we did is uh, we ran experiments, like any scientists. Uh, we ran on 251 breast cancer images. Uh, these were women who had lymph node negative ER positive breast cancers. On the left is a tissue image of an early recurrence. Early recurrence means cancer came back uh, pretty quickly and aggressively. And on the right, we have dis distant recurrence. That means the, the prognosis was good, the cancer didn't come back uh, for, for a long time. AI was accurately able to identify that. And, uh, the images here are tiny to appreciate, but these are all graph-based, the networks that we created. And those networks were we were able to create because of the cells that we were able to identify and those measurements we were able to do and the relationships that we built, these hidden factors and patterns that we never could see with the human eyes, now an AI can see and figure out the predictions. We were able to do 76% with, with the testing that we did. And that number may not be as impressive to other computer scientists, but this is significant if you keep in mind that the current state of a laboratory test that actually does something similar can only do up to 66%. And it takes about two weeks, costs $4,000, and it's only limited to California. So tissue slides have to be shipped over there. This can be done in two hours over a cloud network worldwide. We ran another set of tests or experiments on head and neck and tu tumor images or a pharyngeal cancer. We were able to distinguish between progressors and non-progressors, aggressive versus non-progressors, about 90%. And again, so this, this was just one other element we tested. We also did it with prostate cancer. We've also done it for lung cancer. So in the end, I want to say that we're just at the beginning of the beginning. We're just at the first hour of this revolution of AI. And we're not going to solve cancer by classical clinical trials. But we have this new arsenal, new tool, that will help us curate and personalize a treatment plan for every cancer patient, because every cancer patient truly deserves to have their own equation. Thank you.